Let's start again in the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And I, I praise God for the songs that we just, uh, we just sang. They were, they were absolutely phenomenal in their beauty, but they were also phenomenal in the truth they conveyed. You know, Martin Luther said that, um, well, at least he attributed a big part of the Reformation, not simply to the preaching, but to the hymns that were written because those hymns were sung by the people. They were remembered by the people. And I tell you, there are some songs that we have sung here in the last several months that they're worthy of being remembered. They truly are. Now let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. When we think of theology in the Bible, most of the time our mind goes to the book of Romans, and rightfully so. It's not a systematic theology, but it's the, probably the closest thing we have in the New Testament. Uh, and it is a marvelous book of tremendous Christian doctrine. But I have to admit something to you in the book of Ephesians, the first three chapters, I find the highest, most exalted truths. There is such theology in these first three chapters. It's utterly amazing. And the book is kind of designed around that way. And we can see a, an appropriate way to live the Christian life in the sense that the first three chapters are all about what God has done for us in Christ. Then we get to the fourth chapter and it basically says, therefore, based on everything that you have been taught in these first three chapters, now go on and live according to this high calling that you have received. And that's what I long for you and for me, that we would see biblical truth. And because of that truth, that sure foundation, we would live to the glory of God. Now, there's also a problem that we see in the book of Ephesians when we compare it uh, to the book of Revelation. You see, this is high theology. But when we get to the book of Revelation, chapter two, we see that the church in Ephesus is struggling with some problems. They were quick to point out bad theology. But they had lost their first love. Now. I don't want to exaggerate, but there is a sense in which our blood should boil whenever we hear someone say, I don't want any of that theology stuff or I don't want any of that doctrine stuff. I just want Jesus. It's wrong. We cannot divorce the Christian life from knowledge and doctrine. And yet. We must always be very careful. Each and every one of us is a theologian, whether we admit it or not. And each and every one of us need to have good theology. But theology is not the end goal. Right thinking is not even the end goal. As we're going to see hopefully today, there's a statement in, in Christianity and among those who study the Bible quite a bit uh, and who are prone to use big words. And that is orthodoxy. Right thinking should lead to doxology to praise and to praxis. Praxis is practice, a correct way of living. And so having said that, let's look at the first verse. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Now, Paul, an apostle. What is Paul doing at the very outset of this letter? Paul is establishing his credentials. He's establishing his authority as an apostle. And why is that important? Well, it's important for several reasons, particularly with regard to this book is because he is going to ask us to believe unseen things that are biblical realities. And the only way that if you're in your right mind that you ought to believe something you cannot see is because. Because of the authority of the one who promised it. 
He's going to tell us of great things that not even the most mature saint has glimpsed in its fullness. And so we're going to have to trust Paul. And the only way we can trust Paul is to know that Paul is speaking as one who has authority. Now, the word apostle is used in the Roman Greco world as someone who was sent out, but sent out with orders. But not only sent out with orders, sent out with the authority to speak those orders, to enact those orders. Now, in the New Testament, what do we see? We see that word used in the context. Of these men that have been chosen by God, they've been chosen by God and not only they've been chosen, they have been empowered in a special way so that Peter could say that they were men carried by the Holy Spirit and spoke from God. Now, this is very, very important, and, and I want to say a few things about it. First of all, if you you don't have to turn there, but in Colossians, Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. Now, I want you to understand something because I'm going to apply it to me and the pastors who are here and any preacher you ever hear. Paul says that he is an apostle. And he says, Timothy, our brother. Now, Timothy was highly esteemed by Paul and by the rest of the church. They loved Timothy. They respected Timothy. But Timothy was not an apostle. Timothy did not speak with authority given to him by Christ as an apostle truly was. And no preacher living today has authority as an apostle. And as speakers, as preachers, We have authority only to the degree that we line up with what the apostles have said. Please understand that you may you may hear a preacher that you admire. There are many I admire from from Spurgeon to Martin Lloyd Jones to Dr. Piper to John MacArthur. So many good men, but that's all they are. That's all they are. That's all they are now. I want to look at a few things that are very, very important, and I am going to be depending a great deal on my notes today because I just want to make sure that I'm as clear as possible. So this may not be the most elegant thing you've ever heard, and I'm going to be looking down a lot, but it's more important that you think about the truth that's being told you and not the eloquence of the delivery. Now, first of all, Paul's first task was to establish his authority. Your first task is to determine. Your authority. Now, I know, brothers and sisters in Christ, you're a lot like me. I hope better, but I'm sure you're a lot like me. I know that in my head, I know that the scriptures are my authority, but I find myself thinking thoughts that are not according to that authority, and I find myself doing things that are not according to that authority, and I find myself so often like the men of judges who did what was right in their own eyes. And I'm sorry. I wish I was more. And I hope you are more. But don't just say the word of God is our authority. Because even after 30 years, I realize how difficult it is for me to live that simple phrase. Now, I want to point out a few things. First of all, do you know that we are constantly being bombarded by things that oppose and contradict that are contrary to the word of God? They come from everywhere. They come from the world. They come from the devil. They come from our flesh. They can come from our own hearts, our own unrenewed minds. There's a lot of things being said out there. There's a lot of things that drive our actions and our attitudes. But brothers and sisters in Christ, it it must be the word. It must be the word. Now, I'm going to give you the only appropriate response to the scriptures. I'm going to read it to you. In 1 Thessalonians 2.13, Paul said, For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also, also performs its work in you who believe. I also want you to listen to this. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. 
Now, brothers and sisters, you and I, when we hear the word of God, we must remind ourselves and we must remind each other. That's one of the purposes of a church. Look, this is God speaking to us. We must take heed. We must listen. Also, we must realize that all these thoughts that come into our life, we must take them captive. We must compare them to the word of God. And if they are found wanting, if they are contradictory, we must cage them and throw them out. Now, another thing I just want to throw to you, especially you young guys and young Christians, girls also, is Ezra 7:11. For Ezra had said in his heart to study the law of God and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. The only way you're going to be able to stand on apostolic authority on Scripture is to study the Scriptures. Because the study of Scripture, the reception of truth, something like working out physically. You don't work out physically, your muscles just keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You work out physically, you begin to see some growth. It's the same way with the Word. Now, now listen to me. I don't want to hurt you, but I don't want you to escape from here. With just a pious nod, realize that when we open the book, it is God speaking to us. And we must take it seriously because it is going to tell us things that we cannot see with our eyes. It is going to tell us things that others say are not true. So we must be bound to the word of God. Now, another thing that I want to point out that I think is extremely, extremely important. And please listen to me, because I've seen this as a great danger. Your interpretation of the scriptures and my interpretation of the scriptures are not the scriptures. Now, why do I say that? There are a lot of people who say, bless God, I believe this book. And I think they're sincere. And whatever this book says, I'm going to do. And I believe they're sincere, but there's a there's a problem. There's a fallacy in their logic. They think that their interpretation is synonymous with the book itself. And that's not always the case. Why? Not because the book is fallible. It's not fallible. It's infallible, but because you and I are fallible, especially young people, if you have a lot of zeal for following the Lord, recognize this zeal without knowledge is dangerous. You and I are fallible. I know men who have shipwrecked themselves in the faith because they thought that everything they interpreted in the scriptures was the way that it is and everyone else was wrong. Now, there is a right answer in the scriptures, and if we don't have it, we are wrong. But what I want you to see is all of us are wrong at times. And so what is the cure? Well, if I interpret the Bible and then I just go to you in my church and ask you the same question, that may that may help me as I listen to your opinion. But you and I are of the same church. If I go to every Christian in my contemporary culture, that may be very helpful to me. But also, I need to know that my entire contemporary Christian culture has also been swayed by influences outside of the scriptures. So what must I do to truly discover what the Bible is saying and stand on apostolic authority? Well, there's a there's a thing in the interpretation of scripture that we talk about quite a bit, and it's this. You always do your theology in the context of the church. And what does that mean? Dear sister, dear brother, this is what I do when I study the scriptures, but it's what you must do to some degree that when I come up with an interpretation that I think is grammatically correct, historically correct, I go to church history and I ask myself, has anyone else ever believed this before? And if no one has, I'm probably wrong, aren't I? You see, this is what I want you to develop I want you to love the word, but I want you to love the word in humility. I'm not saying that you go and interpret the passage and then you go somewhere and you, you know, talk to people who don't even believe the scriptures or liberal theologians who don't even believe it's inspired. It's not what I'm saying. But when you interpret the scriptures, go outside of your context and compare yourself to other godly men and women down through history and see if there is unity. 
new things and new discoveries in Christianity are extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. Now, he says here, Paul, an apostle. And then he says, of Christ Jesus. Of Christ Jesus. Now, this is a genitive of. And it can either be a genitive of possession or description. There's a lot of things it can be. There's a lot of different types of genitives. <laughs> but I want to talk about two different things here. When Paul says that he is an apostle of Christ Jesus, he is saying, first of all, that he belongs to him. He's, he's possessed by him. The ownership, the claim upon the life of Paul is Christ Jesus. Now, let me ask you a question. Can you say that? Or let me put it this way so I don't heap condemnation on you because I can't say it fully. Are you growing in that reality? Is your life more and more under the control? Look at me under the control of Christ. Would other people see it and say, my. That person is belongs to another. Jesus Christ. Also, Paul is not only saying that his life, but also his ministry, what he does is under the ownership of Christ. And then we can go even farther. Paul is saying that his life and ministry are defined by the person of Christ. Is yours. Would you say that your life is marked out? By Christ. His lordship in your life. Now, young Christian, let me share with you something that's very, very important. To, to be saved, you must believe in Christ, not only as Savior, but as Lord. Don't let anybody fool you. But here's what you need to understand. As we grow, those realities become greater and greater in our lives. When you say as a brand new Christian, Jesus is Lord, I am sure that you are sincere, but you really don't know what you're talking about. 30 years later, you know a little bit more what that means. And hopefully 60 years later, you know a lot more what it means. It's something we grow into. But look at me. All true believers will have this as some sort of reality in their life. That their life will be defined by Christ and his commandments. That you will notice a growing ownership of them. Now. I want to look at some other things. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. Now, the Greek word here for will is thelema, and it can also mean desire. And here's something that I want you to see about God's will and your life as we look at the life of Paul. And it's this. This this will is not a cold, calculated rationality. It is not this mechanical thing that has somehow been fixed for you. The word here can also mean desire. And what it means is this. God has a will. God has a desire for you. Can't you see woven into that truth more than just do this and do that? Can't you see woven into that truth more than just slavery? More than just him being governor. Can't you see woven into this word God's will. A father's love. A father's love. A brother's love. I want you to embrace God's will. As he shows you his will in his word. I want that for you. But I want you to see this just love, magnificent love of God that is flowing from this. It's absolutely amazing. Now, are you in the will of God? Now, as a young Christian, you're probably saying, I don't know. Well, if you are a Christian, he's got you in there somewhere. Many times we don't know exactly what it's all about, but his providence overrides our lack of knowledge. So you can trust him and don't be afraid. But also, you're not to be lackadaisical or apathetic. 
You're not just to come to a crossroad in your life, some decision, and then decide you're going to get into the word and find out where the answer is. That's not how Christianity works. The way it works is this way. That you have a practice of renewing your mind in the word of God so that you will know what that will is. An old professor of mine, T.W. Hunt, wrote a book on the mind of Christ. That as we renew our mind more and more, we become to think like he thinks. You see, and here's the, here's the danger sitting under preaching and not being under the word of God in your own private life can make you start thinking like the preacher. That's dangerous, even if he's a good man. You don't want that. There's only one authority, and that's Christ. Now, I want us to uh, I want us to go on. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Oh, let me mention something. Let me back up here for a second. And you're going to think this is trivial, but it's not Christ Jesus. Do you know what that means? I mean, so many people think it's like his first and second name. I mean, what is going on here? Christ Jesus. Christ refers to. What's the word? Creo, anointing. In the Old Testament, when when God would appoint a, a priest or sometimes prophet or king like King David, what would happen? Samuel came and poured oil on his head. It represented an anointing, an outward external sign of the anointing of the Holy Spirit to carry out this task that had been given to him. Well, Christ is the anointed, the appointed one. And there was a doctrine a few years ago that was going around in several churches that Christ is anointed and we're anointed and we're little Christs. Throw that out. There's one Christ. Yes, it is true that the Holy Spirit indwells us and there is a sense in which every believer has been anointed, not just the so-called TV prophets. But there's only one Christ. And I would not put myself in a conjunctive relationship with him. Not in that way. He's Christ, he's anointed. And then what else? Jesus is the Greek's transliteration of the name Joshua. Did you know that? It's very, very important. And what does it mean? The Lord is salvation. So who is Jesus Christ? He's God's appointed savior. He's God's anointed savior. And there's only one. There's only one. Only one. Now. He says. We've got through verse one. We're part way, haven't we? It says Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Now we're going to talk about the, what I call the universal nomenclature of the Christian nomenclature is when you have a category or you gather together a series of terms that define a science or a discipline or some some category. All right. There are names that over and over seem to be given to the Christian. Like saint. Faithful. And one that's not so much a name as it is sort of a, a title or a phrase in Christ. Now, I want to look at that for just a moment. First of all, he says to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, the first thing I want you to see is Ephesus was a lot like our world today, they were wealthy. They're, they were idolatrous. They were sensual and they were immoral. But now here's the thing. Ephesus did not define. Who those believers were. Ephesus did not set the standard. Ephesus did not set the goal for who these believers were. Now, saints, listen to me. It's the same way. Your standard is not this world. Do not allow the world to put you in its mold. As Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 talks about. Don't allow that to happen. Do not be conformed to this world. You say, Brother Paul, how much can we, you know, we're in the world, we're not of the world. Yes, that's true. God does not want us to go move on a mountain somewhere and start a cult. Well, then how do we do that? First of all, you can't do that unless you're renewing your mind in the word of God and you're in a 
community of believers who also love Christ and we're all encouraging one another as the day draws near. That's first of all. Second of all, young person, listen to me. Lost people need Christ. You have lost people in your classrooms. You have lost relatives, lost friends. You should not shun them. You should not run away from them. You should love them. Be kind to them. Don't preach to them all the time. The word normal might be good for you. Just act normal and loving and kind. Share the gospel. Pray that God will open up a door. That's what you need to do. Well, when should I pull away, Brother Paul? When you see that you're being yoked. When you see that they're beginning to have an influence on you. You know, do not be unequally yoked. It was a wooden <clears throat> structure that went over the neck of one ox and over the neck of another. And where one went, the other went. When you start seeing yourself getting in that type of relationship, pull out. But even then, pull out graciously. I am so very tired of mean Christians <clears throat> who just want to run away from everybody. No. Not here. We need to be holy. We need to be loving. Now, so Ephesus did not define them. What did define them? There's the word. They were in Ephesus, but more importantly, they were in Christ Jesus. Now, what does that mean? There's the idea of a locative of sphere. It's it's the idea of well, the way I want to put it before you is this. I want you to think about two spheres, OK? And you're either in one or you're in the other. Now, I'm doing this so that you understand what it means for you to be in Christ. First of all, let's look at what we were in Adam. United with Adam under Adam's head. What are some of the words that describe us there? Moral depravity. That's referring to nature. We're morally corrupt, but also acts of sin. You see, that's where Luther comes off with the bondage of the will. Whatever your nature is, your will will do. So it was moral depravity, acts of sin, condemnation, alienation, and also death. That's what you were. That's what you had. That was your inheritance, your endowment in Adam. Now, what is it in Christ? United with Christ, under Christ's head. Well, here are some of the words that we can use. Regeneration. Been made alive. Justification. Legally declared right before God. Sanctification. He who justifies us is working in this life. To make us holy. Communion with God. And synonymous eternal life. Which this is eternal life. To know him. You see. You are you were born in Adam. You must be born again to be in Christ. You were in a kingdom of darkness. You are now in a kingdom of light. And it is this king and this kingdom that ought to be defining you. But listen to me, dear believer, as much as I believe in the importance of preaching and gathering together, this definition, Christ defining you, becomes most complete when you yourself go after the prize. Don't make the preacher go after it for you. You should study. You should know. You should think. And even, even when I preach or someone else preaches here, know this. If you have a question or a disagreement, you owe it to me or the other preachers. As a brother in Christ to come and tell us you don't agree, not so that we can show you how you're wrong. But so that we might learn. Maybe we have seen something in air. I'm not afraid of that. I want to learn. I want to grow. Just like you, I can't do it without you and neither can the elders of this church. In Christ now. I had a young man one time, he came up to me and he goes, Brother Paul, you're right. Christ is all we need. I said, young man, Christ is all we have. That is true. He's all we need, but he's all we have. And he is enough because in him. In him. Everything from the father comes. Everything. He is the treasury. 
He is the door. He's the vine. He's everything in the Christian life. And that's why it'd be so ashamed for you to stop at the pulpit and not go beyond the pulpit to the prayer room, to your own study, to feed off him and taste and see that the Lord is good. So in Christ. Now, he says here to the saints who are at Ephesus. Now. There are certain words I love the New American Standard, I like. ESV is good, different, different translate. Love the King James. I really wish, though, that we could just change this word saint. Because the literal word, the Greek is agios or hagios. It means holy ones. Holy ones. See, saints, when I hear that word, I don't get a picture. Of really what that means for me. And I doubt if you do either. You're a saint. Oh, you're a saint. We may even laugh about it. But when the Bible says you're a holy one. That changes things. That's like, whoa, we need to take this seriously, don't we? A holy one. Now, holy means to be separate from the common and profane and to be separated unto God. For worship, for service. Most of all, dear friend, for communion, to belong to him. See, separation is not just you got out from the bad. You know what that is? You stop right there. Congratulations, you're a legalist. You got out from the bad. Maybe you ought to pat yourself on the back. You're only getting out from the bad so that you can run to the good. And the good is, is him. It's him. Now, let's go on. There is a debate. Does the word holy primarily refer to our position before God, our legal position before God or the fact that God has separated us to work in us? Does does holiness refer to our position before God or does it refer to our Christian experience? To the way we live today, something is it a reality in our life? And my answer to that is yes, it's both of them. It is not either or it is both and positionally we have been made holy ones in that God has separated us out from the mass of fallen humanity to do a work in us. But then there's the other side of that. Those of us who have been separated out. We should be striving. We will be striving. To be holy. You see these ideas of of justification. It's the same way people say, well, justification, is it a legal standing? Absolutely. Is righteousness a legal standing? Absolutely. But those who have that legal standing, God is working in their life to do what? To produce righteousness. Conformity to him. Now, I want to um, just just read something here that I've written. The believer has been justified by faith in Christ. He has literally become the righteousness of God in Christ. Second Corinthians five, twenty one. OK, and that's what we stand upon. This is the believer's position before God. However, those whom God justifies, he also regenerates and sanctifies. Now, there's another word I'd like to change a little bit, but I really don't know how to do it. it means makes holy. He is working to make them holy. They have become God's workmanship and holiness becomes an increasing reality in their life. Just look over, turn the page on Ephesians 2, 10. Look what he says. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Now, finally. So we've said that he does separate us out positionally. He does work in us. Throughout the full course of our life, those whom he justifies, he also sanctifies. Well, here's now the other thing you need to understand. Those who have been justified and in, in whom God is doing a work of sanctification, they will one day be what? Glorified. And those who have this kind of hope, what do they do? They purify themselves. You see that? All right, well, let's go on. He also calls them. Let's go back to to verse one. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus, who are faithful. Now, this is this is this is maybe a little bit more difficult than you might think here. 
Because the word can mean pistos means believing ones, faithful ones. Some commentators go more towards believing ones, others towards faithful ones. I believe that the, the, in this one term, we have both the idea of believing and faithful wrapped up together. So maybe I've just come to a compromise with the whole thing. But here's some things that I want you to see. The believing ones or the faithful ones are the same ones who are called saints. So saints are believing ones. And there will be a degree of faithfulness in them. They are those who remain constant in faith and faithfulness to Jesus Christ. Now, you may say, well, Brother Paul, I, I struggle in faithfulness. Yes, I do, too. But now let me clarify that. Many people will use terminology like that to say, I'm not faithful at all. There's a difference between being faithful, not at all, and struggling in your faithfulness and wanting to be more faithful. A true Christian will want to be faithful. Will seek to be faithful, and when that desire to be faithful wanes, they'll be sad of their waning desire. Now. I want to. Do something here because I feel like it's very important because especially young believers don't understand something. And that is the relationship between faith and faithfulness. Or let me put it in another another term, another way of talking. The relationship between faith and obedience. Now, I'm not talking with regard to our position before God or anything. I'm just talking about practical matters. And here's what I want you to see. We obey God. Because we believe him. We believe that what he is saying is true and that leads to obedience. Let me give you an example. If I say and I'm not saying this, but if I were to say the building is on fire and there was no evidence whatsoever, most of you would not believe and therefore you would not obey when I said run for your lives. But if you caught the reality that the building really is on fire, you would be sure to obey. Now, hold your place in Ephesians and just quickly, I want us to run over and I want to show you how this works out in Hebrews chapter 11. It exquisite illustrations here. Now, look. Chapter uh, chapter 11, verse seven of Hebrews. By faith, Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen in reverence, prepared an ark. Do you see that? He didn't see it. God told him he believed it and he obeyed it. Do you see how faith was the foundation, even the catalyst of his obedience? Now, look at verse eight. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive a place he really hadn't seen. Do you see that? He believed God and therefore he obeyed. Look at look at um, verse nine. By faith, he lived in an alien as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Now, now look at this. This is you. This this isn't Abraham. Look at verse nine. This is you. Do you believe God enough to live like an alien? Or are are you trying to live like the folks down here? Are you conforming yourself to them, to the people of this land who do not know God? Or do you believe God enough to live differently than them, not for the sake of being different? But according to his commandments, do you? You see, it's faith. And you see, why am I going to this? Here is the reason. Also, look at verse 24 just quickly. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God. Now, why would he do that? Because of faith. But what's the foundation of his faith? A revelation of who God is, a revelation of Christ. Actually, the writer of Hebrews is so bold to say. So here's what I want you to see. Does your obedience now now follow the line of logic? Does your obedience wane? Does it weaken? Can you correlate 
the weakness of your obedience to the weakness of your faith? And can you correlate the weakness of your faith to the fact that you do not know God as well as you should? And you do not know his promises as well as you should. Now, why am I harping on this? Because in Ephesians, we're going to talk about all these heavenly realities that are unseen. And if you don't learn to believe God when you do not see, you will never grasp a hold of these realities and they'll never drive you. They'll never drive you. To a passionate, joyful obedience. OK, well, let's go on. We talked about a universal nomenclature. Now we're going to talk about a universal Christian blessing. We're finally in verse two. Grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to know that it is very common in most commentaries to say Paul is combining in this salutation, this greeting. He's combining uh, a Greek greeting, peace of uh, uh, grace and a Hebrew greeting you know, peace. He's combining them all together. He's making these salutations. Well, there's a lot of truth in that, but that's not the point. Here's what I want you to see. When even a common greeting is brought within the context of Christ, when even a common and oftentimes meaningless greeting is brought into the New Testament, it's infused with meaning. Paul is not just greeting these people. This is not just proper letter writing. It's a prayer. A real, sincere prayer. He is praying that grace and peace be multiplied to these people. Now, what does that tell me? Well, I think it tells us something that is extremely important. There are those who argue that we, we've been given all the treasuries of grace in Christ. There's no need to pray for grace. There is some truth in that. But there is also some great danger in what's being said. My dear brothers and sisters, we have been given so much in Christ. I would say 99% probably of what we have been given, we don't even have a clue about. But are we not to pray that grace might be greater manifested in our life, that it might become a greater reality, a greater power driving us. And that's what Paul is getting at here. And that's what I want you to see, not only for yourself, but your brothers and sisters in Christ. What? That you should pray, oh God, manifest your grace to a greater degree in that believer's life. Lord, manifest your grace. That grace began to control them, that the peace of God would take over their lives. Grace, when you see a believer struggling, pray for greater manifestations of Christ. It does not mean that they are somehow incomplete in Christ. They are complete. But we need to adapt an attitude of open your mouth wide that he will fill it. Open your mouth wide. Saints. I fear for myself that even after 30 years, I live in so much spiritual poverty because I will not avail myself of these gigantic storehouses of grace. So. Grace to you. And peace. Peace is the result. Of the knowledge of God. The knowledge of his working. But it's not just intellectual. Peace also has to do with we have been indwelt with the Holy Spirit who feels uh, who fills us truly, organically, spiritually with power to have peace. Now, I want you to look at he says grace to you and peace from God, our father. Now, why does he say that? I mean, just, you know, sometimes you read that, don't you? Just read it and you go, OK, from God, our father. But why is this important? Here's the reason I think this is important. I'm going to read a text to you from First Timothy five. Just listen. Paul refers to God as the blessed and only sovereign, the king of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, who no man has seen or can see. 
God real big. You and me, really small. How on earth, after hearing something like that, do you and I think we're going to find boldness, if we have any sense at all, to draw near to this kind of God? Well, here's the reason. Because he's our father. Because he's our father. Isn't that amazing? See, it's, it's important to hear that. How can one like him bless one like me? Here's the reason. He's your Father. Now, there's another thing that I want to point out here that I think is, is very, very important. He says. Grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now. If you are a person who does not believe in the deity of Jesus, you've got a real problem here, and I'll tell you why. Here we have a verse where God the Father is mentioned in a conjunctive relationship with another person and the title Lord is not given to God. Do any of you have any idea how blasphemous that would be if Jesus was not God in the flesh? Do you see there? I mean, Lord. The word kurios or kirios, however you want to pronounce it, was often, often used in the New Testament to translate that one word Yahweh, that one name of God. And here it's given not to not to God, the father, but it's given to Jesus. The Messiah. That is great proof of his deity and his power. But here's another thing that I want to point out, and this is one of the most important things. The father is the source. I'm going to read this. And the son is the Lord over all the father's treasuries. Many times you and I think of Jesus Christ as Lord and we think of it as manward. He has authority over us. But what I want you to see is that God has taken everything that is God's and put it under him. Now, this is amazing. All the treasuries of God have been put under Christ as the mediator. Now you're familiar with that word because we went through the book of Hebrews, the mediator. But I want to use another word, administrator. And dispenser. Of all the treasuries of God, he's Lord over it. Now, I want to read you something. Just listen. Joseph was made Lord over all of Egypt to dispense the grain to the people that they might live. How relieved were Joseph's brothers when they discovered that the one who was Lord over all the granaries. Granaries of Egypt was their brother. Now, my heart just literally I want to grab you right now by the ears and just shake you. I want to do something to you that you would see this. Oh, that the spirit of God would reveal this to you. You go up to this matchless, this God who no man has seen in this kingdom of light. You look at yourself as as maybe even the world sees you. And you think, how could I call upon him? How could I ask him to even give me a measure of bread? Knowing who he is and what I am, how could this be? And then all of a sudden you look and the Lord over all the treasuries of God is your brother. Is from your stock, as the Puritans used to say. Bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. That he. Runs it all. But how can I be sure that my brother with such greatness would look to one like me? He died for you so that you could come to the source. So that you could come to him. He died. Should never be a question in the believer's heart. With regard to the love of this administrator. And his willingness. As we are going to see. And as, as Paul points out in the book of Colossians. God does not meet your need according to your need. God meets your need according to his infinite riches and glory. 
If you were starving, you would only have need of a few grains of pro- grams of protein, actually. So if you were starving and a beggar and I walk up to you and gave you a sandwich, I would be giving you according to your need. But if I was a multi-billionaire and I walked up to you and decided I'm not going to give you according to your need, I'm going to give you according to my surplus. Guess what? You're very wealthy now. This is what I'm talking about. This is why as the people of God, you do not need to be driven by a whip. You do not be... You don't need to be led by some personality. You need to know Christ. You need to know Christ. I need to know Christ better. Now. I want us to go on. Also in Matthew 24. You remember when it talks about the faithful steward. Who's over his master's house. Who gives. To those in need every time they need it. Well guess what? There's a faithful steward. Over God's house. It's not the pastor. It's Christ. He knows what you need even before you ask him. His coffers are always full. Go to him. Open your mouth wide. He will fill it. Now, I want us to look at the believer's treasury. Verse three. Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has Blessed us with all spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, why does he say God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ? Here's here's some of the reasons I believe he's done that. First of all, Paul is speaking to Gentiles and Gentiles were idolatrous and Gentiles had wrong ideas of a multiplicity of gods. They were had all kinds of gods. Paul here is emphasizing. Since over the. At the beginning of this text and on through the Bible, Paul is going to give Christ. He is going to exalt Christ to such a degree. That it is obvious that he's more than man, more than angel, that he's God. Yet Paul wants to be careful to show the relationship between the father and the son in the context of the Trinity, because the last thing these Gentiles need are two gods. The next, the last thing they need is to draw a separation between God, the father and God, the son, and maybe even God, the Holy Spirit. So Paul is emphasizing here, emphasizing the relationship between the father and the son. Also, I think there's something very, very important going on here because he says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, who happens to be our brother. Now, I want you to look at it this way. In the Middle East, even today, the idea, the relationship between the father and the son is much more pronounced than what you and I would know it. Much more pronounced. To dishonor a son is to dishonor his father and to evoke his wrath. To honor, to honor a son is to honor the father and to gain his favor. And this relationship is also very important because look at you. Look at you. I know you're just like me. I know you're speckled. I know there's sin. I know there's problems. I know there's there's doubts. I know all sorts of things. But you love the son. You love him. You esteem him. You desire to be obedient to him. And for this reason, the father loves you. You love his son. Some of you today, you need to hear that. I know he knows he knows better. He knows all. Look, I'm 30 years into this. And have so many weaknesses. So many failings and they they bother me. They're nuisances to me. They make me doubt. So I know some of you young believers, you must you must sometimes think, how can I go to him? How can I make these gigantic requests? How can I believe you do love his son? You love his son. And you desire to honor his son. And he loves you for it. Yes, I know all you theologians, your brains are clicking right now. Well, I only love him because he loved me first. Yes, we all know that. That's why you can't pray. You're just always so confused about what's the right thing to say. He, he loves you. 
because you love his son. And he will open up heaven's gates. He has. And what, this is, what he's opened up, let no man close because no man can. Now, let's go on. Verse three, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what you need to understand. He's saying, I mean, what does that mean when a man says, blessed be God? I mean, how can a man bless God? Well, in one sense, what is being done here is in one sense, I don't think the primary sense is that when this happens, the person is acknowledging the blessed state of God because of all his perfections, his blessed state. But also it's a declaration that this God is worthy of being blessed. He's worthy of being praised. That's part of it, too. But that's not the main point that's going on in the Apostle Paul right now. What is the main point? He is exploding with praise. He's not just telling others to praise. He's not just saying God is worthy of praise. He is praising. He's praising. And why is he praising? Because of what he knows that God has done for him in Christ. And why is he writing this? Because he wants the Christians in Ephesus and he wants you and he wants me to join him in this jubilant, luxurious, ongoing praise. Ongoing praise. Now, I want us to look at a few things. First of all, the word blessing occurs three times. If you haven't noticed, blessed, blessed, blessing. The first, of course, is an adjective. Eulogetos, then the verb, eulogeo, then the noun, eulogia. It's the word from which we get the word eulogy. And it's when you say or write something, according to Webster, of very high praise regarding another person. And so oftentimes this is used in the Bible as synonymous with praise. Now, here's the point I want you to see. In our English text, it says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. That looks perfect tense. The idea here is aorist tense. It doesn't really talk about the past at this moment, really. It's it's. Blessed be the God and father who blessed us. Now, the question is, when did he do it? Did he do it at the moment of our conversion? Is that when he blessed us? Is that when it all started? Is that when God started thinking about us and helping us and blessing us? Was it at the moment of our conversion or does it go farther back than that? Even before the foundation of the world. And yes, it does. And that's what we'll be talking about, hopefully next week. But here's some things that I want you just to look at. I'm going to shorten this a little bit and I'm going to give you three things about this idea that he blessed us before the foundation of the world, God predestined all these spiritual blessings to be given to those in Christ, to be given to everyone in Christ without distinction before the foundation of the world. Then Christ won these blessings for us on Calvary. He was not just gaining our pardon, but he was gaining for us this enormous Treasury of blessing. And then finally, these blessings began to become realities at the moment of your conversion. You see that? It happened before the foundation of the world. And then Christ came and did what he had to do to win these things that they might be given to you. And then at the moment of your conversion, they began to become realities. And then as you grow in Christ throughout your life, they will become increasing realities, greater and greater and greater realities in your life until the day you step over into glory. And then they are absolute realities. Now, I want us to go on. And I want us to look at the concept of spiritual blessing. And this is very, very difficult. So. So, well, it's just it's difficult. This took me a lot, a lot of time and a lot of study and a lot of prayer and a lot of headache because there are differing opinions, even among the most godly men regarding this idea of what are these pneumaticos? What are these blessings? What are they? They're called spiritual. Now. 
I've written here every blessing. They refer to every blessing in the spiritual realm. Every blessing that the spirit can confer has been given to every believer in Christ. Now, that is really a lame definition. But I tell you what, I challenge you. You go out tomorrow morning and try to paint the sunrise. You go to the ocean tomorrow and try to count all the sea sand that is there. It would be easier for you to do that than for me or any preacher to open up to you all the beauty of what it means that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. But there are some points that I want to point out. A summary of different things that I think are being revealed by this idea that God has granted unto you now. He has given you, bestowed upon you every spiritual blessing. First of all, it means that the blessed and only sovereign, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, has imparted to you something of his perfect state of blessedness. He has invited you to come into his realm and to share in its infinite blessing. Now, before you become materialistic on me, that is summed up in the person of Christ. God is blessed. You know, you look at a person, you say he's blessed. But the person is still encumbered with so many problems and so many trials and so many weaknesses. And yet you count them blessed. You say, oh, I wish I was like them. Well, think about this. Think, I wish they would invite me into their blessed state because they seem to be doing a lot better than I am. Well, then think about this. God, who is the only truly blessed one. Dwelling in heaven has invited you to come into that. Now, another thing that I want to point out, these blessings are spiritual in nature as opposed to merely natural. I'm going to read this that I've written. It's based on first Corinthians In first Corinthians 15. Paul contrasts the natural with the spiritual. The natural he describes as weak, mortal, temporal, perishable and subject to corruption. The spiritual blessings to which he refers in our text are eternal, imperishable and incorruptible. They are blessings of the highest order. You know, one of the things that troubled me in my lostness was this. Because I had seen members of my family. Die. That I loved. I became such a skeptic. Because I'd say nothing matters if I'm young and strong, I will be old and weak. If I'm rich, I will be impoverished in the grave. If I am famous, no one will know my name inside of a hundred years. If I fall in love so that it should be written in the greatest works of poetry, she's going to die. I hated the world because there was no blessing in it. Just frolic from one stupid thing to another. But here is eternity. Here it is imperishable. Here it goes on forever. Greater and greater and greater glory. Do you see why it is so foolish to delight in other things? Do you see why it would be so foolish to try to build a church on any other thing? To try to promise you just principles to make your life better now? No. No, the highest order of blessings. Now, although not these blessings are not limited to them, some of the grandest are laid out for us here in this chapter. And I'll just mention them. Election. Adoption. Redemption and forgiveness, knowledge of God's person and his mysterious, gracious plan and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the hope of final and full redemption. These are just a few. I mean, can you imagine these are just a few? These are just a few. And, but I want you to see, and we're going to be talking about this later. This is not something that you should just think about as pie in the sky. These are also realities to us here and now. And we're going to learn that now. I want to go on for just a moment. These blessings. Another thing about them is that they pertain to life in the spirit, both now and in the age to come. They are mediated and communicated to us through the work of the spirit. And apart from the spirit, they cannot be known and they cannot be applied. 
this, you see now why I spent so much time emphasizing authority, the authority of the apostles, the authority of God's word. It's because if you are going to enter into the reality of these blessings, it can only be by standing on the word of God. Realizing they are yours and the spirit of the living God using the word of God to make them real to you so that they actually do something for you. A good question that saints used to ask all the time. They didn't ask so much as was the sermon good. They would say, did it do something for you? What did it do? How did it change you? You see now. Also, I want to point out that these blessings are to be viewed in light of the character of Christ's kingdom. Now, what do I mean? They are realities. They are becoming realities and they will one day be realities. You say, what is that all about? It's called the already and the not yet of theology. Some the church, some people have an under realized eschatology. That is, they're not living up to what is theirs now. Other people have an over realized eschatology like the church in first Corinthians and many TV preachers that think they're in heaven already. The fact of the matter is, is this, it's like standing on a platform and a train is coming. First, the locomotive has arrived and you say the train has arrived and you speak truly. But then also you can say the train has arrived, but the train is coming, isn't it? And then you can also say it is finally arrived. When finally the caboose gets there and the whole complete train is there near the platform. Now, it's the same way. There is a kingdom. And it's not seen by the eye. There is a king. And I have not seen him, but I love him, Peter tells us. All of this is an unseen reality, but it's not pie in the sky because it's based on God's word. And not only that, as we're going to see, it has been made known to us through the spirit of the living God who uses the word of God to confirm these things to believers. Now, I want us to we're going to end up here. Let me check my. He says that in Ephesians chapter one, verse three, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. In heavenly places, what does that mean? Well, first of all, I want to give you a summary. This idea is found in Ephesians and and in the following context. First of all, Ephesians one, three, God has blessed the believer with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Ephesians 1.20, God has raised Christ and seated him at the right at his right hand in heavenly places. Ephesians 2, 6, God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places. Ephesians 3.10, angelic rulers and authorities dwell in heavenly places. And Ephesians 6.12, spiritual forces of darkness or of wickedness dwell in heavenly places. So we've got we've got literally several different things going on here. At one moment, it appears to be the very throne room of God. But then over here, we realize that we've got also wicked, demonic forces dwelling wherever this place is. Now, the first of all, I need to be honest with you. It says in heavenly places, but actually, literally, it's just in the heavenlies. Places has been added, I think, rightly so. But now. All week. I literally in bed, just everywhere. Try, what is this, Lord? Why? Because some of the men I most respect had conflicting ideas. There just shows you doesn't mean they were all right. Um, no, logically, one of them was right and the others were wrong or they were all wrong, but they weren't all right. <laughs> but I came across something that seemed to agree most with me. And it's from the Greek scholar Westcott, B.F. Westcott. And I think he's hit it on the head. And, but again, I want you to study this. Look at this because this difficult passage. Westcott says it describes the super mundane. Now, super mundane means beyond what we beyond this world. Supra goes over. The supra sensual. That doesn't mean, well, that person is really sensual. Suprasensual means it goes beyond what you can see with 
the eyes or touch with the hand or feel on your face. We see that, don't we, in John chapter 3. You don't know from where the Spirit comes or where He's going. It's supra sensual. All right. Also, let me read again. It's des it describes the supra mundane, supra sensual, eternal order, or as we should say, generally, the spiritual world, which is perceived by thought and not by sight. So he's talking about what we all know the Christian life truly is. Here we are. And we see certain things, we experience certain things, but we believe because of the teachings of our Lord, because the teachings of the apostles, the whole tenet of Scripture tells us that all around us is a spiritual world. That cannot be seen, but it is real, if not more real. Than what we ourselves know here. So now what's the application? OK, here we're going to get through this right now. What is the application? First of all. These blessings that we have received, and we've mentioned some of them, are spiritual realities. But here's what I want you to see. They are none the re less real. They are real. When he says you're redeemed, when he says you're pardoned, when he says you have an inheritance in heaven, when he says all these things, that's more real than anything else. Do you see that? Please see that. Please live in that light. Also, since they are spiritual realities, they are unseen by the physical eye and are unknown to the carnal mind. That's Paul's argument, isn't it? In 1 Corinthians 2.14, he says, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. And that is why if someone asks you, an unbeliever asks you, why are you so joyful today? You say, because my brother reigns at the right hand of God. It's going to look at you as though you need counseling. Because these things are spiritually oppressed. Because I have Christ within me. The hope of glory. Because I will inherit the world. You see that? You see how it all fits now? Now, they are veiled even from the natural eye of the believer. If you have a believer who's seeing visions every day. Of supernatural things, things in their bathroom and everything else. Be very, very careful. Now, I'm not denying that God can't intervene in history and do something unusual. But that's just the fact. It is unusual. And we are called to live by faith. To grab a hold of unseen reality. So these spiritual blessings are veiled even from the natural eye of the believer. Things which eye has, has not seen and ear has not heard. And which have not entered the heart of man. Yet, Paul also says, they are revealed to us by the Spirit and through the Scriptures. You ever wonder why some believers seem to walk in a power that you desire, that you long for? Maybe it's because renewing their mind in the Word of God, spending time with God, delighting in everything that God has done for them in Christ, the Spirit is revealing to them such treasure that you know not of. They're so drawn to heaven because they can see more with the spiritual eye than you can see. Why do I believe Paul the Apostle was granted such revelation? I mean, after all, he went to the third heaven, all these things. Why? Because the man. He was told from the outside of at the outset of his ministry how much he must suffer. He needed a heavenly vision. Now, to some degree, we all do, brothers and sisters in Christ. We all do, especially in those times of trial. Now, but I want to make this very clear. Even though the Spirit reveals to the believer all that has been given him in Christ, the believer still perceives these realities only dimly as though through a cloudy mirror and must accept them by faith and walk in them. I wish I, having walked with Christ for 30 years, I wish I was more of an example to you. But maybe it's good that I'm not. Because you, you learn to see we are all so feeble. 
We are all so needy. We all struggle with so many things. But I can tell you this, the more that you grab a hold of the scriptures, the more you will see the delightful walls and streets of Zion and be drawn to them. Now. I want to read to you just some passages that are going to help. We're going to close quickly. I'm sorry for going so long. Second Corinthians five, seven. Just listen for we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, you can't do that. You can presume. But you can't have faith apart from renewing your mind in the word of God. Oh, believer, believer, listen to me. It's not enough you hear this sermon on Ephesians. You must run this over in your mind over and over and over. Listen to Hebrews 11. One. Now, now faith is being sure of what we hope for, of being convinced of what we do not see. How can anyone in their right mind be sure of something they hope for? How can they be convinced of something they've never seen? Only if God has promised it. And so your ability to grab a hold of these realities and for them to grab a hold of you is dependent upon what? Upon your knowledge of the word of God and God's promises therein. My one of my favorite passages in all of Isaiah that really throws people off when they've never read it before. It's in Isaiah 50, 10. Listen to this. This seems so different. Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. What is he saying? He this is a description of those who please God. Another description is given of those who displease God and are under his judgment. And you know who they are? They're the ones who can't bear with just walking by faith. And so they've got to create their own lights and their own fires. And then they walk in the light of that light they've made. Brothers, we're not supposed to be that way. We don't need this stuff. We don't need props and supports. We don't need to create a revival here. As Martin Lloyd-Jones says, we just need to be ready if one comes. What we need to do is learn to walk in these realities. How do you know it's true the devil rails at you? Because God is not a man that he should lie. You walk in that. Now, finally, we have already said that the Spirit of God reveals these things to believers. In 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 13, I read this. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. What is this saying? Even though we must walk by faith, even though with your own eyes, you cannot see the spiritual blessings I'm talking about, it doesn't mean that they're just pie in the sky hopes because we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit working in our life reveals these things to us and lets us know that they're sure. Have you ever, dear believer, have you ever sat there at night or in the morning meditating on Scripture, seeing things in the Holy Spirit, not speaking to you with an audible voice, but implanting that word in your heart and letting you know this is real. Do you know that? These promises are real. So it's not just we're hoping based on on the word and there's no Christian experience. No, the Holy Spirit will bring conviction of these things into our heart. He is so faithful to do that. These are real. The spirit has been given to us as a down payment of all these blessings. That's what we're going to learn in Ephesians 1:14. through the spirit. The love of God has been shed abroad in our heart. Romans 5, 5. Brothers, don't take that passage, Romans 5, 5, by faith and say, by faith, I believe that the love of God has been shed abroad in my heart. That's not what it's saying. It's saying the love of God has been and it's been experienced by you. He's telling the Roman church, you've experienced this. Have you not believer, you call yourself a believer, have there not been times when the love of God 
was not just something you clung to by faith, but it was a living reality. Please tell me, yes, please tell me that there have been times when God made his love known to you in a supernatural way. Maybe it was just the calm little wind, but it was real and it was powerful. Also, through the spirit, we are assured of our adoption, the spirit of God. If he is in you, cries out, Abba, Father, let you know you really are a child of God. What I'm trying to get through is the first part of this message. I talked about authority. The second part is how you must believe. Though you cannot see with the natural eye. But the third part is telling you that we have also been indwelt with the Holy Spirit who makes these things real. Why are you converted today? Why are you Christian? Why do you believe? It's not because you guys could stand up and give me 10 historical legal evidences for the resurrection. That's not why you believe. Most of you can't do it. I can't do it. Why is it that some person living out in the jungle that's never even heard of a historical legal evidence? Why is it that he's willing to suffer martyrdom rather than deny Christ? How do we know that Christ is our savior? John Calvin hit it right on the head. The spirit of the living God illuminated our hearts and minds and bore witness to this truth. That same spirit bears witness also even today. In our times of need, he comes to us. Our breaks forth within us, better said, and lets us know, yes, these things are true and all of them are only in Christ, only in Jesus Christ. Do you know Christ today? I know that most of you've been in here and you've sat under solid preaching, but the ones who have given that solid preach, I can say that because I hardly ever preach here. But the ones who have preached to you, they also fear for your soul. They know it's not enough just to hear. We're not talking about some wild charismatic experience, but we are talking about this. Is Christ a reality to you? Is he a growing reality? Has his love been shed abroad in your heart? Do you desire him? Do you desire him? Come to Christ without delay if you haven't. There are many who would talk to you. If you have a need, but come to Christ without delay. And especially you young people who you sit time and time again. Under sound teaching of scripture, whether it's in the devotions in your family or what else, do not presume upon your conversion because of something you did. Is there a reality of Christ? Is there? Let's pray. Well, it's a great privilege for me to be here again with you uh, this morning talking about the book of Ephesians. I want us to begin reading in verse one. On through verse six of chapter one, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for the privilege that is mine to be here today. And to teach from this passage. Lord, our minds are so small and our hearts are so narrow. And it's so difficult for us to grasp even the most simple things. Lord, I pray for grace. Lord, not for eloquence. But simplicity. To bring forth from this passage, Lord, the simplicity of your will. Simplicity of your word. 
that it might be taught correctly, that all might understand and be edified. Father, that we would walk out of here with a greater expression, a greater knowledge of you. A greater devotion to you. And a greater understanding of your working that we might have confidence even in the day of trouble. Lord, grant us grace to the speaker and to the hearer. In Jesus' name, amen. Now today I'm going to be again uh, looking at my notes quite a bit. I want to be very precise. There are things that I've written down um, that I labored over intensely so that, so that we would be able to truly understand these great truths of Scripture. Now, in the first three verses, we were studying about the spiritual blessings that have been granted to us. That as children of God, before even the foundation of the world, God decided for us spiritual blessing. As a matter of fact, everything that is contained in the phrase divine blessing now belongs to God's people in Jesus Christ. Now, we spoke much last week about authority. Why? Because in these things, we must stand on the authority of God's word, because many of these blessings, many of these realities, though real and true, are spiritual. We know them through the scriptures and we experience them as we believe the scriptures and walk in the scriptures. We are a people of faith. We are pilgrims on a highway. As it was said about the pilgrim and Bunyan's pilgrim progress, he had the world behind him. He had heaven in front of him and he had a book in his hand. That's the way you and I have to be as Christians. Now, in verse three, we talked about God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And then we come to verse four and we have a very important conjunction. If you have a new American Standard Bible, it is just as or according to. Now, why is this here? Paul is going to expand upon what he has told us in verse three. In verse three, we have been granted every spiritual blessing in Christ now. He's going to expand upon that and tell us exactly what that means and how that came about. Now, I want to read for you and explain three Greek scholars. Now, I don't usually try to bring in Greek scholars and all this sort of thing and try to impress people. But when it will be helpful to us, then I'll bring them in. Now, first of all, I want to read Westcott on this idea of just as or according to. He says several points which follow, the several points which follow, verse 3, display the mode and measure of the blessing with which God has blessed us. You see, you and I, have, as we have sung in these songs, we were radically depraved. We were hostile toward God. We were sinners with war, declarations on our lips and armaments in our hands against Him. So how does it come to be that you and I are now blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places? Well, Paul is going to tell us the mode or the way in which God accomplished this. And not only that, he's going to expand for us what it means to be blessed as we are blessed. Now, he says the historical fulfillment in time co corresponds with the eternal divine will. Now, what does that mean? Most of us were converted some of us a few decades ago, some of us a few years ago. It happened in history. And right now you're walking with Christ. It is historic. It is real. You're walking with him. But what you need to understand is that your conversion, all that you've experienced of God up to this point and all you will ever experience of God is based upon what God did for you before he even created the world. Decisions that he made with regard. Not only to you as a group. But decisions that he made with regard to each one of you as individuals. And a specific well thought out eternal plan. 
So everything that is going on in your life and everything that you've experienced, both blessing and trial, is due to the fact that God contrived a plan before the world was ever created. And God chose you to be a part of that plan. Now, he also goes on to say this. St. Paul, Saint Paul piles up phrase on phrase to show that all is of God's timeless love. Some people wrongly believe that God began to love them at conversion. No. Some people wrongly believe that God began to love them when he made them. No. God set his seal on you to love you again, not just as a group. But as a person, he set his seal upon you to love you. Before even the foundation of the world, it is an eternal love, a timeless love that knows no beginning. My love for my wife knows a beginning. God's love knows no beginning. And will have no end with regard to you. Now, I don't know about you. But that gives me a great deal of confidence. It gives me a great deal of joy. Even in the midst of fiery trials. I know that nothing is outside of the sovereign plan of God for me. Which was created. Which was contrived before the very foundation of the world. Now I want to read for a moment Lightfoot. He writes, the bestowal of blessings was the fulfillment, the realization of the election in the eternal counsels of God. Again, and I want to labor this point because I want you to understand every blessing that you now realize. Every blessing and fulfillment of blessing that you will one day realize in heaven is a result of God's sovereignty toward you. Not only with regard to a plan, but also with regard to his election of you. God chose you before the foundation of the world. God contrived a plan. And now at your conversion, that plan begins to express itself in real time in history and will continue as a reality being fulfilled as you walk through the countless years of eternity. Now, I want to read John Eady for just a moment. These spiritual blessings are conferred on us, not merely because God chose us, but they are given to us in perfect harmony with his eternal counsel. Sometimes I hear believers say, how could God be so good to me? And sometimes the same believer almost has a fear that if they do something wrong or they pass a certain line, God's goodness will somehow cease. And what you need to understand is the whole thing that God is doing is not so much with regard to you, but with regard to expressing to all of creation who he is and how good he is. So the plan that he began before the foundation of the world, his choice of you will never fail. He will not let it fail. He will continue being good to you. He will continue leading you. He will carry you on to glory. Now, if you're here today and you hear that and you say, wow, if God has contrived this plan that will not fail, then I will be apathetic and live in the world. Then that is evidence that you do not know God. But if you hear God elected me before the foundation of the world and God contrived a plan whereby one day I would be with him in the greatest, most undescribable glory. If you hear that and you say to yourself, therefore, I want to love him more. I want to be more holy. I want to be more blameless. I want to follow him. Then that is evidence of conversion. Now, we are going to look right now at several things regarding election. Now, I treat election in the Bible like I treat many other doctrines, particularly the Trinity. Not everything is explained for us with regard to the Trinity. We have certain absolute truths. God is one, 
And there are three persons who are God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. When we bring both of those together and try to explain them, and we should try to explain them, it is still our inference. And it does not carry with it the same power as absolute truth. With election, I take the road of Martin Lloyd-Jones, I take the road of Spurgeon, I take the road of the Reformers. I take the road of the greatest confessions of church history. But also, I want you to know that I acknowledge the mystery in the doctrine. That there is, as though we're looking at a thing from the rim, and that is all. And when we pass that rim, there is so much more going on that you and I cannot understand. But just because we can't understand it doesn't mean that we should deny it. I cannot explain the Trinity. But I will not deny the Trinity. I cannot explain election. But I will not deny election. Or put it away because it's simply against what men think about themselves. When I come to a passage on election, I must teach the passage on election. So let's look at some things. First of all, the fact. There is a fact here. It says, just as he chose us, there is a fact, God chose us. And from that choosing springs forth everything else that God does with his people. Every blessing, every plan contrived, everything that God has determined is founded upon the fact that he chose and he chose a people for himself. Now, the word is eklego, eklego. It can mean to choose, to select, to elect. But here's something within the word that most Greek scholars speak much about, especially in the expositor's um, Greek commentary. And it is this, that it means to look at a number or a mass and to select from that number. Taking some and leaving others. For example, if I had 35 marbles on the table and I selected from that 35 and brought 10 to myself. Now, it's undeniable. That's what the word means. So that's the fact of election. Now, this idea of election also is seen throughout the entire Bible. I'm sorry. Well, I'm not sorry. But if you're angry with the doctrine, it is found throughout the entire Bible. Bible. And let me just look for a moment at Deuteronomy 14, 2. With regard to the nation of Israel, God said, for you are a holy people to the Lord, your God. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. There was one man. His name was Abraham. God chose Abraham. There were untold millions, possibly even billions of people on the planet at that time. There were people groups, there were tribes, there were all sorts and kinds of peoples. And God chose Abraham. Now, anything else you might want to go behind that and try to begin to explain things, that is your right. But the Bible simply says, no, God chose Abraham. He chose him. It was God's Free and sovereign will that chose Abraham. Now, this same passage in Deuteronomy 14, 2 is also taken over into first Peter chapter two, verse nine, and it is applied to the church of Jesus Christ. He says, but you are a chosen race, a holy priesthood, or a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The very same things that were said about Israel in the Old Testament are now taken by the apostles implied to the church. And the primary thing that I want us to see is the word chosen. Again, you were chosen. He chose you. It's undeniable. The word is there. Also, I want to just point out quickly in first Peter two, nine, after saying that they're a chosen race, he says so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
In our passage here, we're going to see something very important. He chose us before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. So there is an ethical and ministerial purpose for God choosing you. He didn't just choose you, but he chose you that you might be holy and blameless before him. He chose you that you, not only through your mouth, but through your life, would declare his excellencies to all of creation. Now let's go on. I want us to look at the background of election for a moment. And I feel like this is very, very important. And also this is going to be very scandalous. I can assure you. But it's absolutely necessary. To understand election, we must understand something about the mass of humanity from which we have been chosen. We must comprehend what humanity is. That's one of the most important truths whenever you're talking about election. And what is humanity? Well, just quickly, let's look in Ephesians. Just a few passages in Ephesians. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the, even as the rest. This is the backdrop. This is what humanity is. Look in chapter 4, verse 17. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their hearts, and they have become callous, having given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. This exalts the doctrine of election. And this proves the necessity of the doctrine of election. That humanity is fallen. That humanity is hostile to God. That humanity cannot save itself. And I'll go further than that. Humanity does not want to be saved. But God. For the sake of his son and to demonstrate his own glory has chosen out of this mass of humanity a people for himself. Now, I want to look at three truths about humanity just quickly. First of all, moral corruption. Moral. Well, let, let me start somewhere else here. I want to get back in my notes. The first truth I want to give you about humanity is this, that humanity is radically depraved. Now, Webster defines the word radical as re relating to or affecting the fundamental nature of something, something that is far reaching or thorough. When we say that humanity, that man as an individual and as a group is radically depraved, what we are saying is this, that that depravity, moral depravity permeates every aspect of his being. Here in my in my notes, I have. Verses to back up what I'm going to tell you. Moral corruption has polluted the entire person, the body. Romans 6.6, 6, Romans 6.12, Romans 7.24, Romans 8.10, Romans 8.13. Corruption has polluted man's reason. Romans 1.21, 2 Corinthians 3.14 and 15. Moral corruption has, has contaminated or polluted man's emotions. Romans 1, 26 through 27, Galatians 5, 24, 2 Timothy 3, 2 through 4. And moral depravity has permeated the will of man. Romans 6, 17 and 7, 14 to 15. What am I trying to say to you? Every aspect of man is permeated with moral depravity. Now let me put it in another way. Every aspect of man is permeated with evil. We would rather hear that man is a sinner. We would rather hear that man is depraved. But the scriptures teach that the mass of fallen humanity is evil. Now, let me go on. Humanity is capable of the greatest evil, the most unspeakable crimes and the most shameful perversions. You do not believe that? 
Have you never studied Auschwitz? Do not think that something like Auschwitz is a phenomenon in humanity or human history. It is the course. It is the run of the day activity of man. Even at this moment, in our own country, we will slaughter thousands of babies a day for our own convenience. You need to understand that what the Bible says about man is true. And you can't understand doctrines like election. And you most certainly can't understand the doctrine of hell unless you understand something. Man is morally depraved. Something else I would like to say is humanity's deterioration into unrestrained moral evil would be inevitable and immediate if it were not for the grace of God that that exists to restrain the evil of men. Now, what do I mean by that? You'll look around and you'll go, well, not everybody's in agreement with Auschwitz. The the atheist will say, I'm a good man. I will charge someone's battery when their car goes dead in the cold. I'm not a killer. And what they don't understand is that the only reason that all mankind does not rush headlong into the moral depravity of Hitler and make him look like a choir boy is because God's common grace is restraining the evil of men so that, then, so that the universe not tear itself apart, giving God time in order to do a work of redemption among men. But if God was to pull his common grace off of all men who lived on this planet this very day, even the men who deny him, it would self-destruct in moral chaos in a matter of a few days. That's why when I'm ever I'm at a university and someone asks me, what about the good atheist? Will he be judged? And I say, most severely. Why? Because if he is not murdering, if he is not killing and lying and stealing, It is by the grace of God that restrains his evil, the very God he denies. This is very, very important to understand. Another thing that I want to share with you is that humanity is hostile toward God and hostile toward the will of God. Now, that's just true. You say, no, there's a lot of people, even on television, Hollywood, everywhere, people who love God. No, no. They love a God that they made with their own mind. And basically what they're doing is they're loving an idol. They're loving a reflection of themselves, do you see? Let me ask you a question. When does God get scandalous for man? I want you to think about this. When does God become scandalous? And people say, my God's not like that. I don't want a God like that. When? When we talk about his love? No. When we talk about his mercy? No. When do people get angry about God when you talk about his righteousness? Now, think about that. When you say that God is righteous, men get angry. Now, why would men get angry at the idea of a righteous God? Because man is not righteous. What is the great scandal about the law of God? When I'm speaking, especially at universities, what will I hear people say all the time? I don't want to hear about the law of God. Why? It suppresses me and oppresses me and holds me down. I had a student actually stand up and say that one time. I don't want to hear about the law of God. It's oppressive. And so I asked him in front of the entire congregation, exactly would you explain to me which law is oppressive? Which one do you hate? Is it uh, love your neighbor as yourself? Is it you shall not lie, bear bear false witness? Is it that you should not commit adultery and steal another man's wife? Or that you should not reduce another human being to an object to be used for your sexual pleasure? Exactly which law is it that oppresses you? And if God's law does oppress you, then what does that say about you? You see, the reason why men are hostile toward God is this. God is good. And men are not. And so when we we talk about this mass of humanity, we're talking about a mass of people given over to corruption, 
hostile toward God and hostile toward his law. But also we're talking about a humanity that loves evil and refuses reconciliation. Now think about that. Not just that loves evil. But a humanity that refuses reconciliation. Humanity cannot come to God. Men cannot come to God on their own. Now, when I say that, people say, well, if men cannot come to God on their own, then God is wrong in judging them in the same way we would be wrong for judging a man who is blind for not being able to read a sign on the road. What do you mean man cannot come to God? I, I mean that because Jesus said that. But what's the explanation? And why is such a man held guilty? Here's the reason. Man cannot come to God because man will not come to God. And he will not come to God because he hates him. And he hates him because he is good. Have you ever heard maybe an elderly lady whose face is just etched with bitterness? And you say to her, ma'am, you must forgive your husband. And she says, I cannot. I cannot forgive him. She speaks the same language. He lives in the same house. She's not saying she cannot. She's saying she will not. She will not. And why will she not? Because of her hostility toward him. Or a political prisoner. The king comes down to the dungeon and says, I will throw open the door. All you have to do is bow your knee to me and acknowledge my sovereignty. The prisoner leaps up, grabs the door, slams it closed and says, I would rather rot in this prison than bow my knee to you. That is man. That is man. Jesus said this in John 3, 19 through 20. This is the judgment that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. Light came into the world. I'm always hearing people say if the believers would just live like Jesus, then people would be converted. No, you would have a lot of believers crucified. Jesus came into the world. And what did the world do? They crucified him. Why? He gives us the reason. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his evil deeds will be exposed. Now. Jesus said in John six forty four. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. And in John six sixty five, and he was saying, for this reason, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the father. Now, I want to read something, a paragraph that I've written here in my notes to make myself as clear as possible. When the scriptures speak about election. It is not in the context of a mass of humanity victimized by the devil that wants to be saved, but lacks the faculties to do so. That's the way a lot of times men are presented. Victims. No, that's not the context. The context is this. It is in the context of a mass of humanity that is morally corrupt, hostile toward God, that rejects every offer of redemption and that would rather spend an eternity given over to corruption and the miseries of hell than to be subject to God in heaven. That's what we're talking about. You see, one of the reasons why certain people have so much difficulty with election and they have certainly so much difficulty with hell is because they think man is good. That there's something good in man that wants God. There's a little spark. There's a little something. There's got to be some goodness in there somewhere. And therefore they say hell is immoral. How could you throw man in hell? What you need to understand is that not true. That's not true. Hell is moral because men are immoral. And the only reason they may look a little moral in the context of present society is because the grace of God is restraining their evil. But if he was to pull back. Monsters of iniquity. 
So every time you see some vile crime that comes out on the local news or some atrocity committed by some government that is beyond even the mind to comprehend, realize that is you apart from the grace of God. That is you. Now, I want to look now at God's motivation in election that I think is very, very important. Since we provide no motivation for God to save us, then what can be the motivation? Why would God save us? Why would he choose us? The scriptures give us two reasons that are interrelated, and we'll just look at them briefly. First of all, God chose us for the sake of his glory. Now, let me read to you what I've written here, that through his work of redemption, the fullness of his glory, that is, his excellencies and his attributes might be manifested not only to creation, but also before himself for his own delight. God has done this great thing to express who he is to all of creation. Now, let me give you a few quotes from the Puritans and from. From other theologians, reformed theologians, Thomas Boston, every rational agent proposes to himself an end in working and the most perfect and highest end. Now, God is the most perfect being and his glory, the noblest end. Now, what does that mean? If I see you standing out in the rain and I walk up to you and say, why are you standing out in the rain? You say, because I my shower is broke. I may think that's an unusual reason, but it is at least a reason But if I walk up to you and say, why are you standing out in the rain? You say, I have absolutely no idea why I am standing out here. This may prove that you are not rational at that moment. Every rational creature, every rational being has a reason for what they are doing. And if they are truly a rational being, they will choose the highest reason or the greatest motivation. And what is that motivation? The glory and honor of God. So God looks down at a mass of humanity that is hostile toward him, given over to every evil, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, exalting self over God. He finds in that mass of humanity and even in his in his elect, no reason to save them. But God. To manifest His own glory and his own power sets his love upon a people and draws them out to display in them and through them who he is. Now, A.A. Hodge writes, since God himself is infinitely worthier than the sum of all creatures, it follows that the manifestation of his own excellence is the highest and worthiest and conceivable The highest and worthiest end conceivable. You know, it's amazing sometimes when I'm preaching and I will say something like God saved you for him. God's motivation for saving you was him and people will get angry. I've always thought that's amazing that if I preach to a group of people, God saved you because of you. They go, yes, amen. Yeah, that's that's right. That's the way it should be. God created this world for you. Yes, God saved you for you. Yes. But if you say God created the world for himself and God saved you for himself and everything's God's ever done, he's had as his highest motivation, his own glory. They go, that's wrong. Do you see how humanism so creeps in to our way of thinking? It's absolutely astounding. Now, I want us to listen to Charles Hodge for just a minute. Men have long endeavored to find a satisfactory answer to the question why God created the world. What end was it designed to accomplish? The only satisfactory method of determining the question is by appealing to the scriptures. There it is explicitly taught that the glory of God, the manifestation of his perfections, is the last end or reason for all his works. Again, let me iterate this point. 
If God were looking for motivation to save man. Do you honestly think he would find it in man? All man has ever done. Is give reason God to condemn him. Give reason to God to condemn him. If God is to do something other than condemn man, the motivation must not come from man. It must come from God himself. And one of those motivations is his own glory. To demonstrate to all of creation just what kind of God he is. Now interrelated with that, though, is also the love of God. The love of God. Why has God chosen you and saved you? He's done it to demonstrate his own glory. Why has God chosen you and saved you? He has also done it to demonstrate his love. Now, let me read for you here. God chose us for the sake of his sovereign love. The manifestation of the glory of God would be incomplete without a manifestation of his love. His love is most manifested in his election and redemption of us. The most unlikely candidates possible for salvation. When we talk about the love of God. What would be the greatest manifestation of that love? To pour out his his goodness and kindness on someone worthy. Are to pour out his goodness and kindness on someone who is absolutely and totally unworthy. And that is what God has done for us. Why did he choose you before the foundation of the world? It was not because of your love for him. But he sovereignly chose to love you. I want to read a passage that is very important in Deuteronomy 7. Just listen to what it says. The Lord did not set his love on you. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you. Now, here's almost a tautology that we have in Scripture. The question is basically this. Israel is asking, why did you love us? And how is that love manifested? In the choosing of us. So the question is, why did you love us, God? And God says this, I loved you because I loved you. And what is he saying? I did not love you because of you. I loved you because in my free sovereignty, I chose to love you. I made a decision to love you before the foundation of the world. And to work out that love throughout all the counsels of eternity into the creation of the world and into eternity future. I chose to love you. If you're sitting here today and you belong to Christ, then you need to know this. He did not set his love on you because you set your love on him. He did not set his love on you because he looked into the future and saw that you would make a right decision. But before anyone could run or anyone could walk or anyone could do anything, God in eternity set his heart upon you and he made a plan to bring you from a radically depraved, God-hating creature Into a creature that would stand before him blameless and without spot in heaven. That's what God has done. In Romans 5, 8, it says, but God demonstrated his own love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And when you put that with the other texts which reveal God's sovereignty and his eternal plan. But God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And this Christ was foreknown or chosen to do that before the world was ever created. Now, I want to look at the context. It says here in Ephesians chapter four, just as he chose us in him, he chose us in Christ. Now, what does that mean that he chose us 
in Christ, that he chose us in the context of Christ, that he chose us in the sphere of Christ and that he chose us with a view toward the person of Christ and what Christ would do for his people. And here's what I want you to see. God makes a sovereign choice to choose a people for himself. But here's the problem. That people is unrighteous. How can God simply choose an unrighteous people and make them his own? How can he take an unrighteous people and work a sovereign plan in their lives all throughout eternity and bring them to glory? How can he do that? Well, here's what you need to understand. When God makes a sovereign decision, that sovereign decision must still conform to who he is, which is righteous. So if God is going to choose an unrighteous people, then he must also conform that unrighteous people to the standard of his righteousness. And he does that through Christ when Christ was on Calvary. So God chose you before the foundation of the world. He also in his plan contrived that Christ would come and do what? Walk on this earth and live a perfect life. Then go to the cross and on that cross that he would carry the sins of that chosen people. That all the wrath of God that should fall upon the ones that were chosen would fall upon the son. And when they fall upon the son. Then justice would be satisfied. Wrath would be appeased. And this great plan stands in perfect agreement now with the righteousness of God. So even though he chose us before the foundation of the world. It was also necessary that he have. A plan and a chosen person to make this entire thing conform to his standard of righteousness. Now, that's the context. Now, when is the time? If you look in chapter uh, chapter one, verse four, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, why is this important? First of all. God chose you before the foundation of the world, which demonstrates that this plan and its completion depends upon God and not upon man. That this is his doing, and that should give you the greatest amount of confidence That he started all this before you were even created. And he will bring it all to pass. Because the primary purpose of this entire plan is to demonstrate to all his glory and his power. He will not let it fail. Now another reason why this is important is because it demonstrates something to you. I have seen believers that are constantly afraid. One moment they think they're saved. One moment they think they're lost. One moment they think they're okay with God. One moment they think they're not okay with God. And they live in a terror of never knowing where they are. But God contrived a plan before the foundation of the world. It was not haphazard. It was not just thrown together. But everything that needed to happen was contrived in that plan so that finally one day you, his elect people, would stand before him in glory, perfectly perfectly holy and without blame. This is the plan. When a person has lived many years walking with Christ, And gone through many, 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 many trials. Not just trials outward, but trials inward. Doubts and failures and everything else. As this happens, that person becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. To the point where the person no longer has any confidence whatsoever in self. Where would their confidence be? If God had not contrived a plan, a plan that was not just thrown together, a plan that was not just haphazard, but a complete and perfect plan done in the perfect wisdom of God 
that he has the power to bring to completion. As every year of my Christian life goes by, I find myself looking less at self and more at God and this great plan that he has contrived on our behalf. Now, I want us to look at the goal of election. Why did he choose you? If you look in verse four, it says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. There is an ethical purpose. There is a reason why God chose you so that one day in heaven, you would stand perfect before God. Now, let's look at a few things. First of all, let's define our terms. The word holy. It means to be separated from all that is common and profane and sinful. And to be separated unto God. The word blameless comes from the Greek word. The ah, the Greek word is amamas. The ah is a negative particle meaning no. Mamas means stain. Blame. Disgrace. Or spot. So why has God chosen you? So that one day. You will stand before him. Without a wrinkle. Without a spot, without a stain, without one piece of blame, without any disgrace. Now, can you imagine for a moment if God had left you in your in your course and in your cause, if he had left you there radically depraved, God hating, full of his hostility and standing in your own righteousness when you stood before him in glory? And before his glorious light, your whole being would be filled with spot, with wrinkle, with stain, with a putrid disease, disgrace and blame would be written all over you so that all of creation would stand up and applaud God's condemnation of you. But through this work he has done for you in Christ, you will one day stand before him without blame and without spot. Now. I want to put this in the context of who God is. I want to read a text to you that I think is very important. Hebrews 4.12 And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now think about this. Think about what I'm saying. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. It's saying that before the eyes of God, Everyone is laid bare. The idea can actually, actually denotes taking an animal that you've just killed, hanging it up and skinning it so that you're able to see everything inside. It's like taking the hood of a car, lifting it up and looking inside. It's like the recent advance in genetics. Before we could understand nothing, we could see inside of nothing. Now we see so much more. I've written here in the very presence of the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting of shadow. You are seen without blemish because he has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Imagine for a moment that all of a sudden you just walk into glory, walk into the very throne room of God, walk into the presence of not only God, but of righteous men made perfect of legions of angels. And you see their glory, you see their light and you're terrified as you begin to drop your eyes and look toward yourself, realizing that on this earth you walked in so much blemish and so much stain. But when you drop your eyes, you see that he has made you perfectly qualified to be there without any shame, without any spot, without any disgrace. You fit. And why do you fit? Only because before the foundation of the world, he elected you. Only because before the foundation of the world, he contrived a plan to do this with you. Now, I want to look at some some particular things that are very important with regard to this phrase, holy and blameless. First of all, he is talking about future. 
And I want you to understand this. In this text, the main idea is future. Now, what do I mean? He begins with eternity past that God chose you before the foundation of the world. When he talks about holy and blameless before him, he's talking about the end of all things in heaven. But even though he's talking about future here, it has some implications for us today. And what are those implications? I want to look at them. First of all, our position before God right now. There is a sense in which we can say we are holy and blameless before him positionally because we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ now. Believer, I want you to grab a hold of this. That although you can look in the mirror of God's word and you can see every kind of stain, every kind of problem. You must stand on the fact that Christ's redemptive work on your behalf is sufficient and that you stand before God, the righteousness of God in Christ, that you can be in that throne room studying the scriptures. You can be in that throne room in prayer. You can walk in the reality that because of the blood of Christ shed on Calvary for you, you can have confidence with God now that you are right with him now. So it has a very important present day application. But then there's another application. We are going to be holy and blameless before him. So how should that impact our lives today? There was a queen. I forget, it was either Elizabeth, Victoria, one of those. In England. And when she was a young girl. No one, all the ones watching her, no one wanted her to know that she was going to be the next queen because they thought she will be unbearable. She won't listen to anybody. She will act like a a little bratty sovereign. So let's keep it hidden from her that she is going to be queen. Around 12 years of age, everyone noticed a complete change in the girl. A complete change. And I mean for the better. And finally, some of the people who were watching over her, the stewards that were caring for her, they they asked her, what is the difference? What has happened to you? And she said this, I discovered that I will be the queen. So I will start acting like a queen now. And that's the way you and I are to be. We were chosen. We were elected. A plan was made to make us spotless and without blame. Holy before God. If we are going to be that. Then let's do that now. Let's act that way now. And I'm not just talking about little rules that you're supposed to obey here and there. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about. Is given over to God with a heart. Being devoted to him, his person before his cause. Loving him, clinging to him, seeking him to know him and then to walk in that. Not to live your life or better yet, not to waste your life in what is common. Dealing with just frivolous things that don't matter. Like a very royal lord in England one time. He dedicated his entire life to growing a hamster with a figure eight on its back. What a waste of life. And yet we do the same thing in many ways. It doesn't mean that we're all supposed to quit our jobs or anything like that. No, our jobs are our ministries. And they're to glorify God. But what I am saying is that we must constantly not just cut away the bad, but cut away the good. So that we might go after the excellent. So that we might live this life for him. Now. I want to read to you a few passages. First Peter 1 15 through 16. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And don't just when you hear this, think about morality and rules. When he talks about being holy for he is holy, the primary idea is not nitpicking legalism. When God says he is holy, that means he is separated from all other things and he acknowledges his worth above all others. And he loves himself with a higher love than can be given to anyone. 
for us to be holy is to acknowledge the worth of God. And to pour out, lavish our love upon him, to be devoted to him, to think about him, to love him. Be holy and the morality will flow out of that. It's not just be clean. But it's to be consecrated, devoted, belonging to him. Second Corinthians seven, one, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Let me ask you a question. Now, come on. This is a simple text. Does this describe your life? Look at it. Cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit. As the Orthodox Jew will go around the house and look for a piece of lint. Or look for a, a piece of leaven, rather. And cast it out to make the house totally clean of leaven. Do you go through your life? Do you examine your walk? Looking for little things that might defile you. And not just things that defile you openly, but it's this defilement of flesh and spirit. Things that would, would make your spirit, make your attitude, your, your core of your being ungodly. That would influence you to act certain ways. Go throughout your life and eliminate those things. Perfecting holiness. Would you, if someone said, what are you doing today? Would you say, well, I'm, I'm perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord? And Christians, if someone gave you an answer like that, would you think they were strange? We shouldn't think that strange. We should perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. Now listen to what he said to Abraham in Genesis 17, 1. Now when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. Now think about that. When you're a young Christian, maybe you're in your teens, your 20s, your 30s, and you're excited about the things of God, and then you find so many men, women that are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and it's like, they're not so excited about growing anymore. They're not pushing. They're not striving. They're not pressing on to know the Lord. They're kind of older now, and they're coasting. Look at what we see here. Abraham is 99 years old, and what does God do? He says, walk before me. And be blameless. Go on, Abraham. Press in farther. This is what I chose you for, Abraham. To walk before me and to be blameless. Those of you who are older like me. Don't think that you're going to, you made it up the hill. Now you're going to coast down the hill. Think of it this way. Every day you're getting closer to glory. And you need to get serious. If ever you got serious about being blameless and holy before the Lord, you need to do it now. You need to do it now. Second Peter 314. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. Young people, let me tell you something. There are stains. All stains Christ can remove, but there are stains that can affect your heart and your life all the days of your pilgrimage here. Avoid them like the plague. Seek to be spotless, seek to be blameless, seek to be holy before him in love. Now, it also speaks of our future hope. Jude 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy. Now think about this. This is a wonderful thing. I've got a trial right now and I really don't know how it's going to come out in the end. And you know what that does? That makes you weaker. When you sit there and go, do I fight this with all my might? Is it a ex wasted expenditure of my time? What do I do? Because it would be a shame to devote so much time to this one thing and then to lose it all. But it gives great encouragement and great strength when you sit there and go, no, I'm going to win. And everything I fight for will not be lost. I will not lose a moment. I will not lose a thing. That's the way it is here. 
It's not like you and I need to, to struggle and try to seek the Lord and follow Him and cleanse ourselves and work to be holy and strive to be consecrated, thinking that in the end we might lose. No, look at the promise. He is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in His presence, the presence of His glory, blameless and with great joy. You're going to win. You're going to be there one day. So now you need to live like it. Look for a moment just quickly. Back to Ephesians. And look at Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 25. Husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. And look at 27. That he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. On the day of judgment, this will be you. On the day of judgment, this will be you. If you are in Christ. You will be found blameless and without spot. So live like it today. I want to end with two passages from the Song of Solomon. When the great king looks at his bride, this is what he says. You are altogether beautiful, my darling, and there is no blemish in you. Can you imagine on the day of judgment when entire nations are condemned? And a little saint stands before the throne of God, covered in the blood of Christ. And God says to that little saint, says to you, you are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no spot. There is no blemish that I find in you. Song of Solomon, chapter four, verse nine. You have made my heart beat faster, my sister, my bride. You have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes and a single strand of your necklace. Basically, what he's saying is I have cleansed you and I have adorned you and I delight in what I have done. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called and these whom he called, he also justified and these whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things if God is for us? Who is against us. Brethren. Your future. Is bright. Your future. Is bright. And that bright future. Will not expose a single spot. Or blemish in you. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, because of a plan contrived by God before the foundation of the world. Now walk in this. Don't be apathetic, but be encouraged. Cause this to spur you on. He who began a good work in you will finish it. Let's pray.